So hello everyone and welcome back to yet another episode of AWS. I hope you are safe and healthy and it's a very tough time for all of us and I can understand how frustrating it can be to stay inside and deal with the situation which is coronavirus. So it's a request that please take good care of yourself, stay at home, stay safe and YouTube is awesome and YouTube is free. So stay at home, enjoy, relax and you can learn something new every day under isolation as well so finally after 50 days we have completed a milestone in our journey in getting certified and i'm very happy to share with you that i got my aws solutions architect associate exam completed so if you want to know how i did it how you can as well get one i'll upload my experience video soon so do watch out for that i gave my exam on 15th march for saac01 and i'm sure you would want to watch it so please make sure you have subscribed to the channel uh, and without wasting any more time, let's go over the road to AWS phase map again. So this is the phase map that we have for the phase one that uh, we were planning to complete and we have almost completed uh, most of the topics that we had. So currently there is only one topic left for us that is DynamoDB for phase one. This one, this one that we have right now is for route 53 or the route 53 as you can call it. And this might be a pretty long session and we will be dividing it into multiple sections for better understanding and clarity. I'll have the references in the videos as well. So sit back, relax and let's start off with Route 53. So Amazon Route 53 is a highly available and scalable cloud domain name system. That's the DNS web service. So let us first understand what DNS is and then we can get into the details of what Route 53 can offer. So when you hit a URL, if you believe there is some sort of magic that happens that uh, the website you requested appears on your browser, then that magic is brought to you by our very own DNS. Not all of that, but the initial part of it. So let's suppose we have our user here and it requested to access the site on the browser. Let's suppose pytholic.com. Then what happens here is the first call goes to our DNS server that translates or resolves the pytholic.com to a machine readable IP address and returns the response back of the IP. Okay, and then the client sends the request back to the web server with the resolved IP address and gets the content as a response back to the client. And what we saw here, we saw that the DNS and what the DNS can do for us is that it can resolve the host name to an IP address, which denotes the way to our web server. So I hope now you understand what actually a DNS does in simple terms, it just basically creates a mapping of your host name to the IP address or it resolves the host name that you have into the machine readable IP address. So let's get back. So let's get back to the root 53 and let's get serious now. So root 53 is an extremely reliable and cost effective way to root end users to internet applications by translating names like pytholic.com into the numeric IP addresses like 192.0.2.1 that computers use to connect to each other. So Amazon Route 53 is fully compliant with IPv6 as well. And you can use Route 53 to configure DNS health checks to route traffic to the healthy endpoints. It also helps you with load balancing as well. And with Route 53, you can independently monitor the health of your application and its endpoints, which we will be discussing in a short while. And Amazon Route 53 traffic flow makes it easy for you to manage traffic globally and managing traffic globally through a variety of routing types that include latency based routing, GeoDNS, GeoProximity, and weighted round robin. And Amazon Route 53 also offers domain name registrations, which you might be aware of, like uh, you might have used GoDaddy or a uh, HostGator or Hostinger. Purchasing a site here also on Route 53 will cost you money. And Amazon Route 53 will automatically configure DNS settings for your domains. So you don't need to worry about that. So if I change the example that we are seeing here for the DNS to the Route 53, then this is what it looks like. So here as well, if you see, let's suppose we have our user here and it requested to access the site, which is hosted on the EC2 instance from the browser, let's suppose pytholic.com. Then what happens here is the first call goes to our Route 53 server that translates or resolves the pytholic.com to a machine readable IP address and returns the response back of the IP. And then the client sends the request back to the server, which is hosted on the EC2 instance with the resolved IP and gets the content back as a response. This is how simple it is. So you must understand. So root 53 
will have a mapping for the host name and the IP address. So when it sees the host name, it will return back. So it will return the mapped IP address back to you so that using that IP address, you can communicate with the instance directly. So I hope that was simple enough to understand. Let's move on. So after you create a hosted zone for your domain, such as example.com, you create records to tell the domain name system or the DNS how you want traffic to be routed for that domain. So for example, you might create records that cause DNS to do the following. So the first thing can be like root internet traffic for pytholic.com or any site that you have to the IP address of a host in your data center. Okay. Uh, or else you can have it like root email for that domain. Let's suppose user at the red pytholic.com to a mail server. Let's suppose mail.pytholic.com. And also you can have like for root traffic for a subdomain called apps.products.pytholic.com to an IP address of the different host. Okay, so each record includes the name of the domain or a subdomain. The name of each record in a hosted zone must end with the name of the hosted zone. First, for example, the pytholic.com that you have, the pytholic.com hosted zone can contain records for www.pytholic.com and apps.pytholic.example.com so which is a subdomain but cannot contain records for a www.pytholic.gov subdomain so aws root 53 has most commonly used records so first one is the a record which is the url to ipv4 mapping the next one that you have here is the quadruple a that is the record that we have for like url to ipv6 mapping and the cname record that is basically a url to url mapping and alias records which are basically the url to aws resource mapping so if you want to map anything like from the url to aws resource like elb or s3 you can map them so best thing about aws root 53 is it's 100 percent available you will never face an issue with root 53 and that's very very assuring and you can use both uh, public domain that you can purchase or you can have a private domain like local.pythol.com and the cost wise if you see here it will cost you around 0 0.50 or 40 rupees per hosted zone per month for the first 25 hosted zones and 0 0.10 or nearly 8 rupees per hosted zone per month for additional hosted zones so these are the few features that we have for route 53 we will be discussing them in future but i'll not go in depth on these topics now so now let's discuss about the most important record type that we have here. So a record is a mapping of the URL to the IPv4 address. So and we spoke about records and in simple terms, what it means is a table that has an entry of your URL and it's mapping IP address. So imagine it being a table with two entries, one for the URL name and its corresponding IPv4 address. Okay, so here as well, what we can see is that we have our web server hosted on the Amazon EC2 instance with the IP address 12.34.55.23 and the domain name https www.pytholic.com. So the first step is that we send the DNS request with the URL and the root 53 server resolves the IPv4 address and returns back the IP address to us. And in the next step that we have, the client sends the HTTP request again to the web server and gets the response back. So remember that A record is to resolve the URL to IPv4, not IPv6. A record is for IPv4. Okay, so I hope that was clear. Let's move on. So I hope you remember TTL or time to live that you might have known him for. So TTL is basically what limits the lifespan or lifetime of the data that you have, which you feel might refresh or will be accessed frequently. So let us ask one question to ourselves, like with DNS or root 53, what actually we access? So we access root 53 to resolve our DNS to an IP address. Okay, so what does root 53 have? So it has a URL to IP mapping record. Hold on to that thought of yours. Okay, so here what happens is we have a user which is trying to access the web application behind the root 53. So when it makes a HTTP request to the web application, what root 53 does, it serves it with the IP address. And what the other thing it does is it caches the request made to it. And it returns the response with a TTL or time to live, which apparently is an integer that's in seconds. And in this case, it returns 200 with the IP 37.25.36.25. So as I told you before, with caching, what happens is it tells the browser for the next 200 seconds that the TTL, the IP should be cached at the client side on the browser. Remember, not on root 53, but on the web browser side. Okay, so what happens is that for the next 200 seconds, the browser doesn't try to resolve the IP. Instead, it just makes the call directly to the web application. 
And once the cycle of 200 seconds gets completed, it sends the request back to root 53 and gets the updated data back from root 53. So can you see the response IP gets changed here, which changed from 37.25.36 to 252 to 247.21.3.21 because there can be multiple hosts for the same application. And this is a pretty important point to remember as well. With TTL, you can make sure the root 53 is not loaded and the traffic is not bombarded onto the root 53 all the time. Okay, so we can go over this once again. Uh, when you send a DNS request with your URL, root 53 sends you the resolved IP address with a TTL. That's an integer value of 200 seconds. Let's suppose it's 200 seconds. Then it holds a TTL period on the browser, which tells the browser that until 200 seconds are completed, you should not ask this IP address again from root 53. And when 200 seconds are completed, it sends the request back to root 53 and gets the updated data. If you see this, you can understand that it can serve as well as a load balancer. And you must remember that uh, TTL can be as low as 60 seconds which would result in a huge amount of traffic being flown onto route 53 and a high TTL as well of 24 hours, which would be very bad in case you are not looking to have stale data or not so relevant content. Okay, so it's your job to decide what the most optimal TTL value should be. And there are other things that are very important to us for to note. So DNS records have a TTL or time to live in order for clients to know how long to case these values and to not overload the DNS with DNS requests as we discussed. And TTL should be set to strike a balance between how long the value should be cached versus how much pressure should go onto the DNS. Okay, and remember that TTL is mandatory and the time for which a DNS resolver caches a response is set by a value called the time to live associated with every record. And Amazon Route 53 does not have a default TTL for any record type you must always specify a TTL for each record so that DNS resolvers can cache your DNS records to the length of time specified through the TTL. Okay, I hope this was clear enough. So remember TTL is a very important concept, not only for the exam, but also as a solutions architect. So hope you remember this. And if you have any doubts, please post your comments in the comment section below. Okay, so let's move on then. So this might be a pretty interesting comparison and we need to look into it. C name and alias record. So C names are basically mapping of URL to URL. And a C name record can redirect DNS queries to any DNS record and directs from one URL to another URL. Only for it's only used for non-root domains, example apps.pytholic.com. So let's dig deep and understand this. So let's suppose we have https.ww.pytholic.com. So here the HTTPS is the protocol for communication. See, this diagram is very important for everyone to understand because not every tutorial might cover this. So please understand this very carefully. And this will help you not only in this exam, but if you're trying to explain others also, you can use this type of example to explain them. Okay, so now, so here we have the HTTPS, which is the protocol for communication. Okay, and www is basically your subdomain. Okay, and pytholic.com or pytholic is a domain name. Okay, and .com is your top level domain. Okay, and the combination of domain and the top level domain makes your root domain or which is called zone apex. Okay, and remember when you hear zone apex, think of root domain, which is the URL without the www, without this, without the www. Okay, so and the www being our subdomain can be something other than that, like shop dot, so like shop dot pytholic dot com, or prod dot pytholic dot com, dev dot pytholic dot com. It can be anything. So I hope you get the idea of what we are dealing with when I talk about root level or subdomain or domain. Okay, so I hope you remember this diagram. So this is the protocol, this is the subdomain, this is the domain name, this is the top level domain. And when you combine the domain name and the top level domain, you get the root domain or zone apex. So when you hear zone apex, remember it's the domain name or the root domain. Okay, so you can create a CNAME record for pytholic.com, that is your root domain, but you cannot have a mapping record for your root domain using CNAME. So what it means, you can create a CNAME record that has the same name as the hosted zone, the zone apex. So as I already showed you what zone apex is, you cannot create a CNAME record that's same as your root domain, but you can create something like what your subdomain looks like. 
लाइक एप्स डॉट पाइथॉलिक डॉट कॉम और स्टेज डॉट एप्स डॉट पाइथॉलिक डॉट कॉम एंड रिमेंबर दैट रूट फिफ्टी थ्री चार्जेस फॉर सी नेम क्वेरीज एंड सी नेम रिकॉर्ड डायरेक्ट डी एन एस क्वेरीज फॉर अ रिकॉर्ड नेम रिगार्डलेस ऑफ रिकॉर्ड टाइप सच एस ए और क्वार्टर प्ले एम सो इट कैन बी एनी रिकॉर्ड टाइप यू कैन रीडायरेक्ट क्वेरीज टू इट एंड वेन इट कम्स टू एलियस रिकॉर्ड्स एंड एलियस रिकॉर्ड कैन ओनली रीडायरेक्ट क्वेरीज टू सिलेक्टेड ई डब्ल्यू एस रिसोर्सेज सच एज द फॉलोइंग लाइक एमजॉन एस थ्री बकेट्स क्लाउड फंड डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन अनदर रिकॉर्ड इन द रूट फिफ्ट थ्री होस्टेड जोन दैट यू आर क्रिएटिंग द एलियस रिकॉर्ड इन एंड इट वर्क फॉर बोथ रूट एंड नॉन रूट डोमेन्स सो लेट सपोज यू हैव एलियस फॉर हेलो डॉट कॉम यू कैन रोट इट टू पाइथॉलिक डॉट कॉम एंड लेट सपोज यू हैव एलियस फॉर हेलो डॉट कॉम यू कैन रीडायरेक्ट द ट्रैफिक टू एप्स फॉर पाइथॉलिक डॉट कॉम सो इट वर्क फॉर बोथ रूट एंड नॉन रूट डोमेन्स एंड यू कैन क्रिएट एन एलियस रिकॉर्ड एट द टॉप लेवल नोड ऑफ द डी एन एस नेम स्पेस also known as the zone apex so uh, so this is a very interesting thing here so if dns is pythonic.com then zone apex is pythonic.com and you can create an alias record for pythonic.com that routes traffic to www.pythonic.com and route 53 doesn't charge for alias queries to aws resources and route 53 responds to a dns query only when the name of the alias record such as apps.pythonic.com and the type of alias record such as a or quadruple a match the name and type in the dns query okay then only you can make a query for this